All right, it's time for Comics Are Great again, the visual storytelling show. Actually, I've been working on a new tagline for Comics Are Great. Uh, I'm thinking about, I'm toying with this, and I'll put it to my guests today to see what, how it works. Uh, the show for comics process nerds. Is that a bad word to use? Uh, and I'll put that as the starting questions I introduce our guests today, my in-studio guest. Oh, by the way, I'm Jersey Joe's cartoonist and teaching artist. And uh, our, our guests today are none other than Lauren Hauser. That's our local in-studio guest, Lauren Hauser of uh, blizzardpaw.deviantart.com. When are you going to get a real site? Eventually. <laughs> yeah, actually, you do have a real site. You just haven't updated it yet. But yeah. do we want to announce it? No. Okay. Well, then we'll save, it. we'll save on that. But Lauren Hauser, for those who haven't met you yet... You are the artist of the Teens Read Comics uh, website for kidsreadcomics.org, right? You did all the artwork for that. You are currently working on a comic called The Innocent. Can we name it? I already named it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, what other kind of things can we find at uh, blizzardpod.dvnart.com? Um, mostly Pokemon fan art. Pokemon fan art, but and then also... There's, there's innocent work, and, and there's a couple, like, portraits. I don't... I don't post on it terribly often. I'm quite busy with school right now, so... Yeah, you're finishing art school right now. I'm not finishing. I'm only halfway through. I thought you were going into your junior year. I'm only halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that's halfway through. Uh, and then the man, the man who's, who's never finished, uh, who's coming in via Skype, our Skype guest, uh, the author of... The Adventures of Dr. McNinja, drmcninja.com. Christopher Hastings is with us. I'm so excited about this. So Christopher Hastings of drmcninja.com. Hello, thank you for having me. And also the upcoming Fear Itself, well, no, it's out now, Fear Itself. It's all, it's all out. Yeah, the third issue just came out, right? Mm -hmm. Fear Itself, Deadpool, which we're going to talk about uh, later on today. But uh, first things first, uh, is nerd a bad word to use? This is something like, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm worried about this word is that whenever I bring it up, there's always that guy who says, Oh, you know the difference between a geek and a nerd. Oh, well, I guess I won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's a perfectly fine word, and I think it's I think it's shed all of its negative connotations in probably the past five years or so. I think it just people understand that it means someone who's super into something. Yeah. Basically, I think it's shorthand for passionate, bordering on obsessive, uh, which that sounds fine. Okay. Lauren, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I, I actually will quote Simpsons. Um, there's one episode where it said nerd stands for not even remotely dorky. <laughs> So, <laughs> I, there was also an episode where Milhouse says, uh, "I'm not a nerd. Nerds are smart." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay, so I want to introduce you guys to the audience who has who hasn't heard of Doctor McNinja yet. Um, I mean, I, this part of this part of the idea of the show is to introduce uh, cartoonists to the local. Ann Arbor community. Oh, that's why I should I didn't say that at the top. I'm supposed to say that. This show's recorded live every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, out of the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan on the corner of 5th and William. And uh, so, yes, so for people who haven't heard of Christopher Hastings, let's go into talking about uh, Dr. McNinja, which I would describe as... Uh, I hope this. this I hope you take this in the spirit it's intended. Uh, it's Frank Miller if he actually knew how to have a good time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I think Frank Miller and I just have different ideas of what a good time is. <laughs> so my, that's my wife chuckling uh, in the studio here. Th does she want to? Does she want to wave hi to the audience? Sure, sure. Oh, I don't know if I have a camera ready, but just do it. <laughs> it's Skype. It's low res. Hi. Right, so th this is your wife. Uh, we didn't catch your name. Uh, this is my wife, Carly Minardo, also a frequent cover artist of Doctor McNinja. That's right. Oh, awesome. So you married a creative person. Those mm -hmm. are the best kind of people to marry, actually, if you're a creative person. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, we're totally like sharing a desk. She's got the, the Cintiq over there, and I've got the other, the, the tablet here. And we're we, drawing Mad Men Carly is currently drawing Mad Men characters. Which ones? Uh, right now, it looks like she's working on Roger Sterling. Oh. Uh, just make sure to make him look, look as much like a chicken as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Got that, he's got that chicken face. Yeah, uh, I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and there is a chat client. Get some chicken. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're, we're streaming live at comicsgreat.tv right now, and if people uh, in the chat want to post any questions, I'll be there to I'll be watching that to do follow up. But but let's introduce people to Doctor McNinja. What's what is Doctor McNinja? Um, uh, uh, well, uh, I will start by saying that is not a description I would have ever thought of for myself. Uh, but I can, I, I immediately start thinking of some stuff. I'm like, yeah, I guess that can kind of click. Um, 
Dr. McNinja is the adventures of a doctor who is also a ninja. Um, it's sort of, I would say, an absurdist action comedy. Um, in the, uh, I guess, an easy way to sort of give the gist of what's going on in the, in the very first uh, issue, he, uh, he tries to cure a little boy who comes down with Paul Bunyan's disease, uh, the disease that makes you turn into a giant lumberjack. And uh, his parents are his parents, uh, the McNinjas, are ashamed that he is a doctor and not a full-time ninja. And, uh, <laughs> I think that kind of gives you a pretty good gist of the of, of the world. Yeah, you know, it, it, I, as I was reading, I was picking up on it, like, you know, I'm not, I don't know if this is an influence or not, but it has a lot of the same kind of humor as Sam and Max Freelance Police. Did you ever watch that cartoon or play that game? Uh, no, I didn't. I've always, I've always been kind of like perfectly aware of Sam and Max and always sort of been like, that, that's something I should check out at some point. It looks good. But uh, no, I've never really never really read or played or seen any of it. There, there's there's like a common kind of... Well, I would, I would say Sam and Max is a little bit more... even more absurdist and maybe has less plot than Dr. McNinja. It's it's like it's like it's it's based on a game, but I mean I love the show. But uh, but th that's a, that's another thing is like Dr. McNinja like there's a lot of absurdist kind of humor like his secretary is a gorilla who loves hot dogs and you know his, his sidekick is a 12 year old with a mustache that I'll let you say how he grew that mustache <laughs> uh, through through sheer force of will. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean there's a lot of absurd stuff, but there's like there's story to this thing. I mean like there's real relationships and growth and there's plot and you know it's not. Not just a bunch of memes that you'd find in, on Tumblr or something like that, right? I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've always sort of stuck to the the idea that uh, Doctor McNinja has uh, a very absurd or a very ridiculous sense of logic, but it will 100% stick to that logic and try to play things like introduce something ridiculous, but play it completely straight, like as though everything is like really matters and is like really important and it's not you know people aren't like oh, look at this kid with a mustache you know? <laughs> right right very serious that he has this mustache <laughs> <laughs> so here's the premise that we're going to operate under at least i'm going to try to operate under is so i got lauren here who is all of what 16 17 years old something like that 20 20 years old okay so <laughs> you're just starting out and 17? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a Doogie Howser kind of thing. I thought it was, it was like a child prodigy. Uh, but you're just starting out. You're, you're, you're about to, you're working really hard on this innocent graphic novel. I mean, how many chapters do you have thumbnailed now? Uh, five. How many pages? Uh, 150, something like that. 150? Yeah. 150 pages you've got th uh, thumbnailed. So she's getting ready to do this as a webcomic. And... I wanted to go to a guy who's doing this and doing it pretty good. Doing a, he's, you're, you're, you're making hay, you know? People seem to get, enjoy it. Uh, and, and sort of pick your brain on lessons learned, advice. As a guy who's been doing this since, when did Dr. McNinja debut? 2005 or so? Yes, uh, October 2005. So an internet years you're old guy now, right? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's just the, you know, I, I, teach a, yeah. I teach a lot of teenagers, and I was just, t I overheard them the other day uh, having a conversation, like, you know, like, like guys our age will have a conversation like, oh, do you remember Captain Planet? And we'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember Captain Planet. Uh, I heard these kids doing that with HomestarRunner.com, and I was like, oh, wow, is it really that old? You know, but they were talking about it like, oh, this was for my youth, you know, because yeah. for them it was when they were 10, you know, but <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, like you know, going back into uh, you know, picking your brain about the, like where you came from and how you got to where you are, and anything that we can glean from your experience to help the next generation of cartoonists. Um, I heard that you studied under Walt Simonson. Is that right? Yes, uh, among among uh, several uh, really sort of legendary cartoonists that I was I was lucky enough to uh, get into classes with. Um, yeah, Walt uh, was was sort of like the last uh, teacher that I had, uh, which is I think why that, that comes up more often than not, is um, I end up seeing him more often after school now, and, uh, and he was sort of like the last guy that I had, and um, I worked on the very first Dr. McNinja in his class my senior year in art school. Wow. But um, I, also, I also had uh, David uh, Mazzucchelli and uh, Klaus Janssen and uh, Joey Cavalieri, um, but forgetting a couple right now. But yeah, I had a lot of really great cartoonists as teachers. Wow. So going to a good art school, I guess, would be the first bit <laughs> of, <laughs> of advice. <laughs> uh, go ahead and dump thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs> 
getting to be allowed to talk to your comics idols, and uh, that's a good start. No, I don't think it's necessary probably anymore. There's a lot of good books. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I mean, if you want to talk about the books real quick, uh, uh, Klaus uh, wrote the uh, DC Comics Guide to Penciling Comics, and that... Uh, I, I got that after the first semester in his class, and it's basically the textbook from the class. And I think I learned the most in a real concentrated period from Klaus Jansen, because he was sort of the first cartooning teacher I had. And it was just like every week he was like laying down these storytelling principles, and I was like, "This is amazing! I had no idea there were rules in art. This is this. Is <laughs> I can grasp it because before that, at SBA, you have to take um, like a foundation year, which is just fine arts painting, fine arts drawing, like an English class, um, basic Photoshop, and uh, the teachers were very sort of hippie-ish about everything, and, and it was kind of like, I, I feel like uh, I learned a lot more once I got into a cartooning program, and they're like, no, there's good cartooning and bad cartooning. Like, <laughs> if you can't tell what's going on, it's bad cartooning. If you can't better but might not be good yet because there's all these other stuff you have to hit too interesting uh, that that's a, that's a really interesting point to jump on is that you defined it as uh, whether or not you can tell what's going on that's kind of independent of what your skill level as a draftsman is isn't it or is it uh, well the draftsmanship can certainly come into it absolutely um, I think I think one of the early lessons that I learned was like you know they were, they basically said if if you want to go for a style where you don't have where you don't really want to be the particularly like greatest draftsman, that's okay, but it needs to all sort of fit together. So like maybe a guy would draw like take a really like long time drawing like a really perfect building, but then like their anatomy is a little off, and that is really really jarring. Whereas like another guy did a much simpler cartoony thing, but all of it synced together and it was okay. Yeah. So like I, I certainly think that if if you if you're trying to draw a Coke bottle and it looks like a wine bottle, uh, that could make your scene read completely differently. Good point, yeah. So it's about clarity and visual harmony, right? Mm -hmm. So that, is that like one of the things they focused on at, at SVA? Yes, absolutely. I think the, the very first lesson was uh, comics have to, it's clarity and entertainment and it has to be both. Are they, so, teaching, are you te they teaching you that at school, Lauren? Are you picking up? Any examples of where this this lesson came through, or are you still getting through like the the basic you know life drawing classes? I'm I'm still sort of getting through the basic life drawing classes. What about next semester? I don't know. Actually, I have a new teacher. I don't know what he's gonna. Well, what's the class? It's it's still another illustration class, but it's just the upper level one of the upper level ones. Yeah. And I in the past it was focused on a lot of digital work and apparently the full human body anatomy because. The last class we took was facial expressions, mm -hmm. so I don't I don't know. But I, like I said, we had a new teacher. I don't know what we're gonna go over now. <laughs> <laughs> is um is this um is this just sort of a general illustration or uh like general fine arts sort of program you're going through? Or is this cartooning? It's it's an illustration. Oh, okay. Uh, degree. So. Um, are they do they have any cartooning classes? I know a lot of schools that have an illustration program will throw in like one or two cartooning classes for people who are interested. Well, my my professor before he left, he was a he was a cartoonist, so he used a lot of examples and that was our, our final projects had a lot of cartooning aspects to it. And he did teach a class when I was a freshman, I couldn't get into it that was specifically uh about storytelling, writing, making sure it was clear. Yeah. But it was a high-level class I couldn't get into it. Yeah. Well, hopefully it'll be offered when you're a senior. Yeah, I kind of hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I remember uh, there was a story about uh, on NPR about Ernie Cologne uh, when he did the 9-11 Commission Report graphic novel. Uh, great book. Everybody should read it who really loves the form of uh, comics. Uh, really great book but the the interviewer said to him like oh did you find it difficult to simplify all those all those pages of text into drawings and he's like oh no 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 cartoonists don't simplify they clarify you know oh, and oh, very nice, yeah. So, yeah very uh, like well I'll leave it to Ernie Cologne but uh, yeah it's like it's distilling ideas down to a communicative kind of form right and that's independent of like what your your drawing style is like I mean this is one of the things that I think a lot of beginners get stuck on is like oh I have to draw well in order to make comics well no you need yeah, to draw no. Cons consistently right yeah I, and I would say that now that XKCD has come along uh, yeah. I think a lot of people are, are uh, <laughs> and the oatmeal you know it's like yeah I mean Although, he, yeah oatmeal has a really terrific I think expressive style too oh like, totally I actually enjoy a lot of his drawings 
Oh, totally. No, and like hyperbole and a half. I mean, the the real the the really great thing about that comic is the expressive style of it, right? And it's not what you would call really classically defined illustration. <laughs> so, uh, so that, that that's point one. I think that's that, that's really good, actually. Um, I want to talk to you about your style evolution, though, Chris. I mean, because you know, when you go back to the early Doctor McNinjas, it's not as strong visually as it gets later oh, on, right? Yep, that's good. No, I'm I'm a I'm a boy who's learning how to draw every day. <laughs> uh, so wait a minute, wait a minute. You didn't come out of school just fully formed and like I'm a pro and I know how to do this and I'm just going to draw perfectly every time and it's never going to get any better. Nope, I put every single instance of that being absolutely incorrect on the internet for people to look at. <laughs> I think this is great because so many young students I work with uh, want to go back and revise and endlessly revise and, oh, now chapter two looks different than chapter three. I need to go back and redraw it. What's your attitude towards that? No, I think it's a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, what is it? It's like uh, perfect is the opposite of done. Oh, who said yeah. that? I, I don't know. I say it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got it from somebody. <laughs> so... I mean, you leave the old stuff up. I mean, what's the oldest stuff you got online? What's the oldest stuff online? Yeah, like uh, of yours. I mean, I'm not even talking about just comics. Do you have anything even older than that? Because, like, I, I recently posted on Google+, Plus like, uh, a comic I did when I was 11. Because I thought, well, you know, why not? Why not share it? Yeah. Um, I, I do have a ton of comics, like, in my closet that I did in school that are not online. But the oldest, uh, I guess, stuff that I did online was, was for... Uh, Various features on somethingawful.com. They, uh, I, I did, but they were like little stupid MS Paint drawings that were purposefully bad looking. Um, they did a Photoshop Friday feature where you do like little Photoshop collage illustrations uh, around the theme, and I did a lot of those. And that was in like maybe 2004. That's probably or, or 2003. I think that's the earliest anything of mine has been online. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do, do you ever run into anybody uh, expressing dismay at how the style changes as they read the comics? I mean, there's new readers coming in all the time, right? And so somebody's got to start it. You have this really terrific page at drmcninja.com. If you click his face, you, if you're new to the site, you can go and get a primer of what to expect there. And it has all the characters with pertinent links to the really interesting parts of the story. It's a really great way to introduce yourself to the series. But... That's going to take them to earlier pages, and when you start looking at those pages out of sequence, you notice there's some real uh, disparities in the way the pages look. I'm just wondering, for the cartoonist out there who's saying, oh, i got to wait till my stuff is good enough to be online, or I have to wait till my stuff is cons consistent enough, here's an example of something that changes over time, and you can see it very easily. Have you ever experienced any negative reactions to that? No, never. Everybody is really into it looking better as they read it. Um, uh, I, I've heard that quite often where like I'll see maybe like a, a discussion on a forum like Reddit or something like that and they'll be like, oh yeah, I, you know, they're like, here's here's like the first story and they're like, and it gets better looking as you go and they're like, oh, like it's not like, oh, I clicked on this page and there's this, you know, this beautiful color on the most recent page and like, like this, you know, horrible dragon monster, but uh, <laughs> it's it's a really terrible looking Ronald McDonald. You know, no nobody's ever said that. Although they could, <laughs> no, I've never heard it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like even earlier on too. Like there's there's the the art gets more refined, the backgrounds get more rich, and yeah, it eventually becomes <laughs> color too. You know, the, the the background issue. Uh, the backgrounds got a lot better once I was able to do this as a full time job. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the the I didn't draw a lot of backgrounds like those first. Uh, I'm gonna say seven months or so where I had like a day job where I was like I was out of the house for like 11 hours a day or, or more I think, and yeah I was like no you know they're on a pirate ship I have to keep drawing. <laughs> uh, that that's another one is is uh, the grinding you got to do at the beginning right, mm -hmm. right like how much. This is what you're gonna have to prepare for, Lauren, when you get out of school, and you're gonna have to make money. And how 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 do you how do you find the time, Chris? I mean, uh, well, when I when then. I had the, when I had the job, oh. <laughs> Commissioner Gordon, everyone. Uh, Gordon. Is uh, that really the dog's name? Yes. Oh, that is so awesome. <laughs> Oh, Commissioner Gordon, you. everybody, for those who are uh, listening after the fact, we're watching on video. Commissioner Gordon is standing on Chris's shoulder. And, and now she's she... nonplussed. Like, <laughs> <perfect>. Away. <laughs> it's just magic. 
Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Making uh, the time. Oh, yeah. Well, I really hated that job I had. And um, I, so, and I kind of, I had an idea, like, I felt, I had a lot of faith in, uh, in Dr. McNinja as sort of a, this is a crass way to put it, a marketable character. Um, uh, people get it really quickly, is to say, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I knew, I knew that it, it had legs, basically. So, um, I just, I'd wake up way earlier in the morning than I wanted to, uh, to go, you know, take a, a long commute that was full of people on the subway, and I wouldn't be able to sit down, and, uh, and just, like, every morning be like, this is why I have to work on Dr. McNinja tonight, because I am, I hate this, and this must stop. You know, going home and relaxing with television isn't going to change any of this. So, it was, it was more about <laughs> using comics to, uh, to get the lifestyle that I wanted. <laughs> just, I work at home now. <laughs> Yeah, and and I can I can say as somebody who's been doing that uh, in a freelance capacity, oh gosh, that that is huge. Not having to ride the commuter line in the morning, um, but yeah, yeah, okay. So it's 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 a perseverance thing. It's just the, it's just grinding through it. And the, yeah, really, it's I and I've also said before, I am I'm pretty bad at a lot of other jobs that aren't comics. Like my skill level in comics is way higher than like my skill level as like a halfway decent administrative assistant, you know, or anything like that. I so it's sort of like it's it, I it had to work. <laughs> this, this is it. I have no other skills in the marketplace. I need I need to make this comic thing work. Um what what would you say to the person who says, yeah, but I don't feel I don't feel it every day. I don't feel like drawing every day. Yeah. What do you say to them? Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> um, I, I would just say, I, I, it's just, it's like, how important is it to you? Um, you know, and uh, this actually is something that that, uh, that Walt talked to us about, um, and he was saying, like, he's like, listen, I don't feel it every day either, but I have, you know, decades of experience on you, so that if I'm having a really crummy day, I can still crap out a page that looks like what you spent hours on, you know, as a 20 year old. So you, you keep at it long enough, and like, yeah, you're not really going to enjoy the comic making, but at least it'll look decent, and it, it's a hump that you, it'll get you over. And then you know you look forward to the next page that you do enjoy doing. It's just it's it's really just all about like how important it is to you, and and I think that that uh, differentiates the professionals from the people who are just really into it is that the professionals will work on days when they don't want to, you know, understanding mm -hmm. that it is a job. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Job you like, but it can still be a job. Well, yeah, yeah. Anytime you're accepting money and you, you're making a commitment to do something, it becomes a job. And I think this is something a lot of young artists also uh, miss out on, is this idea of, it's yes, it, it, there are unpleasant unple aspects of having a job, but that doesn't make the job any less enjoyable. It's a job you love, right? And that's yeah. the hard thing to really drive home, is because they, they think it's just going to be, like, to quote The Simpsons again, is that I, all I do is eat candy and watch R-rated movies, you know, as a cartoonist. You know, so, um, okay, well, I want to get at some of the other things that you introduced into the series that I think is really interesting, and I want to see if I can probe your thinking process on this. The alt text humor, this is something you pointed out to me, Lauren. Mm -hmm. You want to describe it? What, what, what makes it jump out at you? Um, it was, I don't, I don't know. It, it, it's always something extra to look forward to, and the some of the pop cultural references in it were... Describe what it is for well, us. Yeah. Um... Obviously, when you go to the website and you roll the clicker over the page, then an uh, alternate text box shows up. And uh, like, like the one you pointed out to me, I thought was really good with the pirate ship. Oh yeah, um, I don't, I don't remember exactly. At this oh, point. I think I wrote it down. You did. I think I, I, um, so I'd, I'd be a lot better if I remembered exactly what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was like goodbye pirate ship that I drew differently in every panel or something I like that. <laughs> Yeah. So, but th this this started it, it it started early on in the, in the comic. This idea of like when you hover over the actual comic, like a little Easter egg of alt text pops up. But it wasn't there from the very beginning. I mean, you know, I went back just to double check, and page one it says page one. You yeah. know. <laughs> so, uh, this idea of like embedding extra layers of humor in it. How did that come up? Was that, I'm guessing it was probably a natural thing. Like you just like, oh, this would be funny, and then it just kind of took on. Um, I actually, I was aware of a couple other comics that had already been doing it at the time. Um, uh, Dinosaur Comics, uh, 
Akewood and um, uh, Wigu, I believe, are all web comics that are, were already doing it. Okay. And, uh, it's a lot more popular now, but uh, at the time, yeah, I, I think I was maybe the, the fourth guy to do it or something. That's that's probably silly to say because there's so many web comics out there that I've never heard of. That's probably sure. not. But at the time, yeah, it, it was a little less known, and it was actually sort of a secret joke. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, people would email me. They're like, I just read 50 pages, and now I just discovered you've got these extra jokes on all of them. Now i got to go back and reread it. Which, but, from a crass marketing standpoint, that means more page views, which means yeah. better ad rates. Yep. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's really good. But then there's another layer to this that I think is really cool, is that now when you do these collections in this book, now you have annotations that you can put on the bottoms of the pages, right? Like funny yeah, annotations. Right. That, so that, that's pretty actually, good. In that book that you have there, uh, you were saying it's not from the very beginning. One of the little bonuses I did in the book is I added it to the very first story. <gasps> Look so at that. that's not on the website, but it's in the book. That book's out of print now, though. So. Oh, slag. Well. Sorry, everyone wants to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry, <that's>... <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're going to be at SPX this year, right? That's right. Yeah, so you get the new books at SPX uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, September 11th. But yes, right here, I'm looking at my brother threw up once after drinking blue Kool-Aid and it went all over the floor. It remains one of the best things I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of stories, uh, I, want, I, I wonder if you could tell the story about your fake German accent at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you know, this might be easier if I pull up the Twitter and I can actually remember exactly what I said. You're chronicling this on Twitter? That's 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 how I heard about it, through the grapevine. Yeah, uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, but I, I guess I'll, I'll lay out the story here quickly while I, I try to find it. Um, People should uh, be following Dr. Hastings on Twitter for great stories like this, by the way. Yeah, um, so I was, I, was, uh, I was at the airport... And I, uh, I, I kind of really didn't give myself enough time to get on the plane. Uh, I mean, in ideal situations, it was, it would have been totally fine. And um, but uh, I showed up, and it was a really long security line. So I have, uh, I have my tweets here from the me heading out really early on uh, the morning. This is to go to San Diego Comic Con. Uh, catching a flight out of Newark. Um, I'm going to censor my swear words here <laughs> for audio. Thank you. Uh, in order, it goes, um, ha ha, this is the longest security line I've ever seen. I'm not making this flight. <laughs> next tweet. Beep. <laughs> uh, next tweet. All right, I'll just say, uh, crap. Uh, next tweet. Okay, there's a large German family at the front of the line. I'm going to act like I'm with them. Next tweet. I can't believe I just talked to several TSA agents with a fake German accent. <laughs> Next tweet. The family doesn't seem to realize what I did. So close. Hee <laughs> hee. Oh, tee <laughs> hee. All put in a separate line. Only 12 of us. Totally making this fly. Oh, are you freaking kidding me? One of them tried to bring a sword on the plane. Like an ornate medieval sword. He's trying to explain he got it at medieval times, and the TSA agent is trying to explain it doesn't matter. We're all stopped. And then a minute later, they all brought swords. <laughs> and then uh, a half hour later, I missed my flight. <laughs> is, uh, that, is that true? They all brought no. swords? Oh. Okay. And, uh, this is a 100% fabricated story, except for the part where I, I stood in line. I was like, I'm not making this flight. I, I put us that on Twitter. But then the line moved really quickly. And I was like, oh, I've got maybe like a half hour to stand here in line. I'll make up a little, it's it's like 7 a.m., I'll make up a little Twitter story. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, I kind of wanted to do like a real sitcom -y style joke story where like sort of the character does something like outrageous and kind of selfish and is then punished karmically by something even more outrageous and in the end doesn't win. But, it, but I, I thought that would be to do over Twitter. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. Uh, I want to get at this idea because this leads me to, to the next thing I wanted to pick your brain about is um, Lauren has reported to me that you said once, because I missed this if you said it uh, when I was following you on Twitter, I get my best ideas by pretending I'm a five-year-old. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah, I, I have definitely said that before. I don't think I've said five-year-old. What's funny is I said that before before Axe Cop came on the scene. Oh, yeah. And, uh, which is why I think Ethan, Malachi, Malachi, and I get along so great. Axe Cop, if you haven't discussed it on the show before, is a comic that is written by, I believe he's seven now, a seven-year-old and illustrated by his 30-something-year-old brother. Yeah. So it's really ridiculous ideas like 
this policeman with an axe goes to fight dinosaurs, uh, which is something that totally fit in Dr. Big Ninja, uh, and because I totally go for my, my child brain whenever I write a lot of stuff. Yeah, the, the the axe cop thing is is great, and yeah, this is something that uh, uh, I see a lot in my I, I do classes for nine through twelve year olds, and there is nothing like what you see come out of an eight year old to ten year old brain with absolute sincerity, and they're playing it totally straight. This is Top Hat Chicken Lord, and I say, what's the deal <laughs> with him? Oh well, he's a chicken, he's the lord of a planet, and he wears top hats, and they explain it to you like that, like, well, duh, don't you get it? You know, this is laser legs. He has lasers for legs, and that th kind of thing. And, and you see such brilliant ideas coming out of these kids, and like, I want to read that comic right now. Uh, and so, yeah, X-Cop is like, of course. Um, but I love this idea of saying that getting in touch with that kind of five-year-old sensibility. Because as I was saying earlier on in this discussion, you know, when you read Dr. McNinja, it's not just a bunch of absurdist memes thrown at a wall with kind of a thread of a story. There's, a, there's, a, there's writing there. You have to write like a grown-up, but you also <laughs> have to write like a kid too. Yeah. And, and I wonder, how do, you, how do you stay in touch with that? Because I'll tell you, when I'm teaching adults, it's when I tell them, you got to get in touch with that eight-year-old self, uh, they don't know what the heck I'm talking about. Oh, well, um, I, uh, you know, I just, I, I, I guess I, I still have the same ideas about what, like, my opinion has not changed on dinosaurs, pirates, and sharks, and spacemen. Basically, and I just I remember that I think all those things are cool. You know, uh, I I remember how scary I used to think ghosts were in a very specific way, and I just I, I think about stuff like that a lot. And then you know, then I you know crack into my you know storytelling theory and uh, you know uh, Robert McKee or whatever, and, and then try to you know make uh, something that makes sense out of it. So yeah, in other words, like. Uh... I think of uh, a conversation, a reported conversation between Ray Bradbury and um, Harryhausen, where they shook hands and agreed as, when they were young men that they would never stop loving dinosaurs, and that <laughs> led them to the careers that they have. Yeah. <laughs> what a lovely yeah. idea! A big skeleton warrior. That's <laughs> <laughs> just this is such a beautiful idea of like grown men saying like, "Let's never stop loving dinosaurs," you know? So <laughs> not hard. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got this one. I got my T Rex stuff plush right here, you know, ready to go. So but that, that is something that I think young, young people need to be told, is it's okay to still be childish about that kind of stuff, right? You yeah, know? sure. Because mom and dad sure don't like hearing that, right? <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so, I mean, just keep, keeping a, a young mindset or getting in touch with it again, I think, is, yeah, and actually remembering, like, that kind of um, guilelessness about about loving the thing wholeheartedly just because it is what it is and not getting into it. it's like story theory you can easily confuse you into trying to make something more sophisticated than it is right and sometimes it's just it's just cool to have a pirate ship and a doctor a doctor ninja show up and <laughs> ruthlessly murder everybody on the ship peg faces for everybody i think was the line <laughs> I will say I'm, uh, it's something I'm kind of coming to terms with as someone who's who's creating something that goes along as I've become a lot less comfortable with having him just murder people. <laughs> I think because I've gotten to know the character a little bit more, and I'm like, he's my friend. I don't want him to keep murdering people all the time. But he's uh, a, but he's a ninja too, right? I know, I know, I know. It's it's on, it's just it's something that I'm working out. It's, yeah. It's, and I think about constantly, and uh, you know that will, it'll probably have some sort of ramifications in the story at some point. But uh, yeah, like he killed an innocent man in the first issue just to get his uniform, and that was the joke. It was like the good guy is killing someone else and just doesn't care. Like, and uh, yeah, I I I put in little hints about like how conflicted he feels about that on occasion, but I don't think I've really addressed it as uh, properly as it should yet. But because I haven't really figured it out myself yet. That, that's that's a, a really good point, too, is that when you live with a character for as long as you have been, you're going to, like, it, it, you know, I, a question I get asked uh, every once in a while by cartoonists is, uh, uh, how do you know w whether or not this project should be, how, whether or not I should make this into a webcomic? It's a marketable idea. Like you were saying earlier, you know, you knew that Dr. Ninja had legs. People get the concept uh, very quickly. Uh, but then... The next question is like, should it be a webcomic? Should I invest years into this thing? That's the, the stuff that's facing a young cartoonist who's just starting out. And uh, the thing you got to brace yourself for is, right, a relationship forms between you and that character, right? Yeah, yeah. That said, I, I certainly I have no qualms in hurting him. 
I, uh, I have I have the best time when I'm writing really tragic situations for him. <laughs> um, but that that's because that was something I learned early on was you know like you need to be cruel to your characters or else they're just going to be uh, you know just childish sort of uh, fan like self fantasy pieces you know where like oh yeah and he's the most awesome elf warrior and he's got like. <laughs> Panther sidekick. Oh no, I'm describing something real. Hold on. <laughs> well, the, the problem is that like other kids will imitate. I'm referring to the uh, Forgotten Realms character, Driss Dorn, uh, who oh, is wow. like super teenage fantasy character. Like, oh yeah, he's like he's real like tough, and like he's the good elf, and all the bad elves, and he spins his swords around, and he's best friends with the panther. But the problem is, like, people will imitate that, and then, like, their character goes through nothing that's any of real consequence at all, and it's yeah. just, it's completely meaningless. So, it's hurt, hurt your, hurt your buddies, murder your darlings. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I once did a, uh, oh, this never got published, but I was so happy with the scene. I wrote the scene where it was a character essentially along those lines, and they were, uh, all, all the main characters of the story were living out their fantasy. Like, they got transported yeah. to, like, this kind of uh, ec ecstatic fantasy. And this girl's fantasy was driving in a car, shooting machine guns out of the side of the car, and everything in the world was on fire behind her. And then she had sunglasses and a cigarette. You know, that was her perfect world. And I think about those kind of characters, like the Boba Fett kind of character, the wish okay, fulfillment. That's a good example. Yeah, they just they they're just they're just awesome at everything all the time. That's the, this scene you described it sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't let don't let anything I've, I've said here disparage that ever. <laughs> oh, thank you. It, it never got published though, unfortunately. It got it got to the penciling stage, and then the book got canceled. So uh, it, uh, maybe I'll I'm gonna dig it out and put it on Tumblr or something. But um, okay, uh, where else was I gonna go with that? Um, oh, doing a regular web comic series long form. That's a challenge because web comics traditionally work best, well, historically, when they're a strip, when they're a little bite sized, done in one thing. I can look at it, I can share it with my buddy at work, and I can walk away. Uh, it's got to be a challenge doing something with like a long narrative, like page style, right? Yeah, I absolutely. Th I think it's it's a uh, it's it's very challenging for a lot of long form comics to uh, gain uh, traction online because of the the nature of people browsing, which is just to bop along to different websites for tiny little 30 second chunks and then that's just how people you know browse the web generally uh, occasionally someone will sit down and enjoy something in a very big satisfying chunk but um, personally I have the advantage of having a comic where I can provide uh, individual satisfying moments of humor and action and that's generally how I handle it where I try to make each page satisfying into itself in the way that a comic strip is where I will either have something blow up, or someone will say something funny. Uh, usually on each page, uh, you, and uh, yeah, that's that's generally how I handle it. That's got to be a challenge, though, because you also collect these. These are collected by Dark Horse Comics as full, meant to be read in, you know, like the the lean back, sitting in a chair kind yeah. of approach, right? Totally. And it reads it reads good both ways. That's got to be tough to balance that, right? So it doesn't just read like a strip after strip after strip, right? Um, yeah, uh, well, you know, it's, it, it is absolutely, it's a balance, um, and I, I've kind of tried to set up a rhythm of, like, oh, looks like the Skype kind of locked up on us, and it looks like, uh, Chris, now Chris is frozen giving us a gang sign. <laughs> Those are watching the video. Oh, there you are. Are you there, Chris? Yeah, okay, okay, so, okay. uh, where did we cut out there? Uh, you were talking about a rhythm, how it's a rhythm when you do this. And I, and I love yeah. that word, visual rhythms. Let's hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I just, um, I, I try to do a little plot moving forward and then, you know, and basically have some of it might, might take a break for a joke. And um, obviously uh, in uh, action uh, comics and movies, the action serves to move the plot forward. So that's easy enough uh, to, to keep things going forward that way. But um, yeah, it was something that I thought about a lot whenever I started it as a webcomic. It was originally supposed to be a book. I, I sent it to several publishers that either rejected Dr. McNinja or I never heard back from. One of which is Dark Horse. Awesome. Yeah, it's in their slush pile somewhere. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they, they contacted me not knowing it, it had ever been submitted to them. Uh, to be fair, the pitch was awful. It is, it's, it's, uh, it's a, I wouldn't say I was immature, but I would say the pitch was immature, absolutely. But um, 
it, it took working on it myself to actually get it going someplace worthwhile. But anyway, the point is that it was meant to be a book, and I knew I could do it as a webcomic, um, and I kind of knew, like, oh, you know, with these webcomics, like, they're all, like, satisfying updates. I didn't quite phrase it to myself that way in my head. I, was, I didn't quite have the language to myself yet, but I saw what was going on. I knew I'd have to break it up in this way, and um, I remember I'd be like, oh, okay, so I was going to have this page be that, you know, this this guy shows up and then he says something. I was like, it's probably better that he, if he says this on the next page so that the previous page can be kind of a cliffhanger. Um, and it's sort of little adjustments to that that I've just really gotten used to doing. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll break things up so that it's a little more page turnery. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I mean, it's really ba based on the same kind of principle of trying to make your book page turny, right? Yeah. You want to put like the moment that goes, oh, what's going to happen next on the bottom right of the facing page, so you, the reader, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. I, and I was, I was taught to do that anyway. I'm, uh, one, of, one of my teachers made the point, it was like, you know, on a comics page, set it up that you have a setup and a punchline, uh, you know, and the punchline is at the bottom right hand of your, your page. It doesn't have to be a literal joke punchline, although if you're doing a humor comic, it might not be a bad idea if it is. And, um, and I was kind of operating on that anyway, so it wasn't that, that tough to adjust things. How far do you work ahead? Uh, let's see. I'm going to draw. I'm going to pull up my, my little... I have a little buffer note that, I, that says, how's my buffer? Uh, let's see. I have, I have written up to September 2nd, penciled up to August 29th, inked today, no, ink Fridays, and today's is colored and posted. So uh, I like to be a little more ahead of that, but yeah. that's really the status of things. I, I was just trying to get a sense of like how far you have figured out like where everything's going with this and like oh, thumbing it, in the, you know. Yeah. The, um, the general sort of notes for things are planned very far in advance. Um, I, uh, I've, um, let's see, like I always, whenever I start a story, I always know how it's going to end. Um, I might not necessarily know how it's going to get there, but knowing how it's going to end makes me do make little maneuvers that look like I'm operating smarter than I actually am. Uh, people are like, oh my god, you had this plan for years! And I was like, well, no, not necessarily, but I did remember this one detail from the comic very long ago that I thought would be cool in this one, and, <laughs> and I very subtly it looked like I planned it all. Uh Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Lauren, do you have the ending figured out for The Innocent? I know you've gotten... I, I do, actually. Do you really? Good. Yeah. So, and you've been, Lauren, you've been spending... How long have you been doing the thumbs now for The Innocent? About, what, four months? No. Um, Three months? Two and a half. Okay, two and a half. But you're you a good chunk through. But, you know, what, well, uh, one of the things that you said, you were going to have this entire thing written in a year before you set pen to paper for the final, right? Yeah, I'm that's, that's, try your, for that. that's your promise that you, that I'm I'm making public now. Oh, thank, <laughs> thanks, Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so now everybody can uh, follow Blizzard Paw on Twitter and give her a hard time if she's not done a year from now. But, but yeah, no. But this is a good thing to put that much work in ahead of time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like what Chris was saying. That's why I was I was getting this idea from him. It's like a lot of people say like, "Well, I'm going to wing it," and that that does work for some people to just wing it, right? But oh yeah, I've I've, I've done both ways where I've. I've you know, and winged it and gone a little improv -y, and I've done stuff where I planned it out. And I'm finding more and more that I prefer to write as far ahead as I can so that I can then ed edit it. Um, because um, uh, real writers, uh, good ones, uh, uh, know that writing is really rewriting. And uh, yeah. maybe your first idea isn't your best. And unfortunately, I have had some days where I'm like, uh, and then uh, this happens, and this needs to go up in an hour, and then I draw it and then put it up. And it might not be the best fitting moment or scene or page in a story and could be cut. I actually, there are, pa <laughs> there are pages where there are mistakes in my books, and it's lucky that it happened this way. In the first book, there is a page missing that nobody caught because it had no impact on the story whatsoever. It, wow. just, it just got organically cut from the story because just no one noticed. And then in the most recent book uh, from Dark Horse, there's a page where the word balloons didn't make it on and nobody noticed because it didn't affect things at all. Wow, uh, that's awesome. And, yeah, it's, it's this sort of weird organic version of editing where just like the stuff that's not necessary just floats away <laughs> in my 
<laughs> file mistakes. <laughs> Have you ever made a change to a page like you had it thumbed maybe two, three weeks in advance? You had the story moment figured out, and then like input from a reader will make you rethink that entire scene, or you'll in introduce a new scene because of reader input while it's updating online. Because I did a, I did a graphic novel that I serialized online for three years, and I noticed that reader input early on i had the story written it was all thumbnailed i was just putting you know doing the final art but then like some really interesting questions came up as they were getting through the first two chapters so when i got to chapter three i was like this is the place to put in that explanation that i never had in the original draft did anything like that ever happen to you with publishing online um no i i'm i i i find that i generally am thinking about the comic more than any readers are and <laughs> a lot of questions will come up and i'll be like yeah yeah i know i'm gonna get to that you know like uh -huh. I've, I've already thought of this. <laughs> <laughs> so but it does appear sometimes, though, that uh, I know that like readers be like, "Ah, oh, I knew it. I, I sent him an email asking what happens with this." And I was like, "Well, no. If you if you you know if you follow the plot, this was going to happen. It's because it's serialized. That you know, yes, it took months to get around to, and I've gotten ten people emailing me about it. But it's like it's just because it's serialized. If you're reading in a book, the answer would be answered. You know, the question would be answered in about five minutes when you." You know, you just got to that page. Were you? Were you? Uh, you haven't always been tri-weekly with the updates, right? Were you re re weekly before that, or were you always three days a week? Uh, it was always tri-weekly. Uh, although there have been periods where it was a little less disciplined, uh, I would say that's about it. But yeah, always meant to be three times. Wow, a week. that is an impressive amount of work to put on yourself when you have a day job too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, I, what I tried to do is I would work on one. Oh, I also had an inker at that time. That's true, yeah. I had an inker to help me out. And so we would try to get done one page over the course of the weeknights and then Saturday and Sunday draw the other two pages. And we were broke, so we didn't have anything to do anyway. So, it, <laughs> uh, so that's part of the formula, too, is be broke so you can't afford yeah. to do anything fun. But we were we were pretty used to that kind of workload in, in art school too. Um, That's true. I think we, when we graduated, we had to draw. I think we had to finish two pages a week for one class, and then we'd have to do various other projects for other classes too. So it kind of averaged out to we'd be drawing three pages a week. So it, it, if you are in art school like Lauren, then you would say like just don't take a break after you're done. Just keep up with that rhythm afterwards. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, the, the real very first Dr. Ninja I did where he fights McDonald's, um, I did for a, a summer class in between my, uh, my, my junior and senior year because I found that between my freshman and sophomore and sophomore and junior uh, years, I would just stop drawing in the summertime and it would take a really long time for me to get back in the groove thing. So I was like, I need to take a summer class. So I'm still drawing comics over the summer. And it helped out, It helped me get back into things my senior year. Uh, I noticed much faster than uh, my other classmates who just stopped in the summertime. So yeah, um, not taking a break is a good idea. Yeah, that, that's not a problem for you though, Lauren, is it? I mean, yeah, every time I see you, there's like five more pages added to your sketchbook of, yeah. David. Yeah, it's it sounds like with with it sounds like this is an ambitious project that you're well into, and I, I don't think any sort of keep at it sort of. Uh, yeah, I, I think you've got that figured yeah, out. Yeah, you got that figured out. But now my next question is what I'm uh, also concerned or interested in finding out is what would you say to a young artist about grinding out pages on a weekly or biweekly or triweekly basis? I mean, how do you start to make it work for you? What did you do to make it work for you, or was it just a matter of just putting in the hours and then things start to happen? Um, I'm not. What do you What do you mean by making it making it work? Well, turning it into a day job. I mean, that's a big question. Uh -huh. I know. You know, that's a really big question. But, but I mean, like, are there any little things that you look back on and go, like, that was good. What I did there, that was smart. Oh yeah. Well, um, uh, I think I think I've heard someone say before that it was like uh, breaking into comics professionally is like breaking out of prison. You know, like you make a hole and then the guards patch it up so no one else can leave that way. Well, of course, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what, 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 let, me, let me rephrase it to say, like, I'm really looking at it like a thinking strategy. Like, how, do you th how did you start to think about it differently? Or did you when it started to, when things started to work for you, right? Oh yeah, okay. So, um, the, at, at the time, uh, the, the big thing with web comics uh, was uh, t-shirts and t-shirts are still a big part of web comics. I have designed a lot of t-shirts that I sell and at the time uh, a big idea was you would take uh, a concept or a quote 
uh, from your comic that could be uh, taken out of context and changed slightly and put on a t-shirt so that people could understand it and think it was funny without knowing the comic that it came from. So it's not necessarily a t-shirt with Dr. Ninja on it, but a t-shirt with the quote, ninjas can't catch if you're on fire, that, you know, still does really, really well for me. So I, I understood how the t-shirt game worked, basically, and I designed some t-shirts. Um, and then once, I mean, then as far as like actually working at it, so I had a couple t-shirts out and I was able to quit my job. Uh, that was just learning about a whole new world of, of discipline when you don't have to get up at a particular time in the morning. And because uh, and it was it was a really uh, rough first year when I was doing it professionally because I'd I'd have an attitude of like oh you, God, you know I don't have to actually start working on comics till like seven p.m. if I don't feel like it you know I can stay up who cares and then I would stay up really really late and they weren't turn they wouldn't turn out as good and then I would sleep in later and then like I was shipping my own t-shirts out and I'd be like yeah I can do this tomorrow but then like emails would pile up and just uh, it would get really overwhelming. Um, so yeah, I just sort of had to maintain a, a discipline of working on things, even if I felt like I didn't have to, just out of keeping my own sanity. And then actually when I started uh, dating Carly, she had a day job, and a big part of it was being like, yeah, you know what, your girlfriend's going to want to hang out after six. Like, you, you shouldn't try to work on comics, and you should get, maybe follow a schedule like hers, so that, you know, you're not this unavailable, terrible boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that helped a lot. <laughs> Oh, what a glamorous life you're painting for for Lauren here. <laughs> getting yeah. getting yeah. up early, working nine to five. Uh, yeah, I remember my first month uh, when I became a full time freelancer working from home. I, I I went through the same thing where I was like, I don't want to shower. Oh, there's a bottle of wine. It's nine o'clock in the morning. I'm gonna listen to the traffic report and drink wine. You know, <laughs> I think everybody has to go through that a little bit. But yeah, the big part of it is like just staying yeah, on top I, of your stuff, right? I did have one day where at nine o'clock uh, there was a Jean Claude Van Damme marathon on TV, and my roommate and I decided that we got a case of beer and we decided we're going to get up, we're going to shower, and we're going to start drinking beer and watching Hard Hard to Kill at 9 a.m. and just keep <laughs> all day. And that was a lot of fun. Only did it once. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, sure, have, have, you know, and it's nice sometimes we'll, we'll run off to the park or whatever. Like, so like, like you, need to, you need to keep kind of disciplined, but sure, enjoy the the fruits of being able to work from home occasionally. Occasionally, right? It's like it's like uh, you know, running a Kickstarter and a Jean Claude Van Damme marathon is something you should only do once in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. You can't do that all the time, otherwise you're going to wind up ruining your career. So there's there's another a piece of wisdom to add to this. Uh, okay, but you know when I when I start saying uh, when I say that it started to work for you, here's another interesting thing that ha that's come of this. You're doing this Deadpool book, uh, Fear itself, Deadpool uh, from Marvel Comics out now. Go to your local comics retailer. If you're in the Ann Arbor area, you can go to Vault of Midnight or you can go to Dearborn and go to Green Brain Comics. Uh, pick up all the three issue series. Uh, how did that come to be? Is this something where you were knocking on their door? Or did they come to you? Um. Well. Uh... I, uh, there's a there's a very popular uh, comics blogger uh, named uh, Chris Sims, and uh, he works for Comics Alliance now. But at the time, he had a he he kind of blogged personally about comics, and he ran into my inker at a convention and just saw the Doctor Ninja books out on the table, and he was like, "This looks like exactly like I want to read." And he picked it up, enjoyed the books, and he has been very kind uh, to me in all of his reviews, and. Um, there's a, a Marvel editor uh, by the name of uh, Jordan White who reads this blog, and he heard about Dr. McNinja through his blog and then picked up the books from me at another convention because he doesn't read web comics, but he reads these comic reviews. And then he liked it a lot, and then he saw me at another convention, I think, and he was like, hey, you know, I read your books, and I, I work at Marvel, and he gave me his business card, and I was like, oh, you work at Marvel. I sure would like to write Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> And then he was like, oh, sorry, I, I work in the Hulk office. I, I can't help you out there. Uh, I was like, I feel really terrible about it because it was just so crass. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, you know, I saw him again. And he was like, yeah, you know, we really should work on something. I was like, I would, I would love to, whatever you want. And then one day he emailed me. He was like, hey, why don't you come up to the office and we'll have lunch. And then we did. And I was like, ooh, I wonder what, wonder what this is about. Uh, and then we did. And then he's like, so I'm the Deadpool editor now. 
And I was like, oh, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, and he just said that um, basically, you know, Marvel's doing this big Fear Itself event, which is, uh, you know, one of their big crossover things. They have a bunch of tie-in books for all the different characters. And um, Marvel scheduled a Deadpool tie-in to the Fear Itself event. And uh, without actually consulting Daniel Way, the current Deadpool writer, and then Daniel, was like, he's like, I, I don't have time to write this. So like, no. And, oh, wow. uh, and then uh, so Jordan was like, ah, I know a guy. I know a guy who might want to do this. And uh, and then it was kind of like a really rushed deadline for the first issue. I think it was like I had to I had to pitch like the the, the three issue miniseries in a week, and then a week after, and then once that was all approved after some notes, like then I had to turn in the page by page outline a week after that. And then the full script a week after that. So uh, wow. and then after that, it was a, it was a pretty regular schedule for the for the other two issues. But yeah, it was you know being able to come in in a crunch, you know, in sort of a slight emergency, I guess, really sort of helped out there. You would would you have been able to do that four years ago? I would have made it happen absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was trying to get at here is I was I was, I was hearing like several things. Here. Go ahead, Chris. I, I would say my story probably would not have been very good. <laughs> um, uh, there, I actually still I made a few rookie mistakes actually on the series that I look back and I was, because it's my first time working with a, with a, a team of artists that are not me. You know, I was writing for someone else to draw it, and sort of not really. And I was writing in my mind as though I would be drawing the scene, and then seeing how this artist did it differently. Some stuff is a little, uh, it's a little, uh, it's a little clumsy. At least in the first issue. After that, I kind of figured out how to work with him, and it comes off a lot more smoother. And uh, and yeah, and like I made a I made a couple of mistakes in there. I still think it's a very enjoyable story and, and really funny, but I definitely would have really messed it up four years ago. Uh, it's just just experience in writing comics. But I definitely would have absolutely made. I would have come up with something had that over. <laughs> out of sheer desperation, just do, to oh. do the thing, right? Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's a couple things I'm hearing here that I think are really interesting. One is. You, these opportunities presented themselves because you had the passion and the vision and the, the, the perseverance to execute your own book and find your voice, right? Yeah, yeah, which, yeah. which led to somebody finding it going, this is exactly what I want to read, which led to the recommendation that you needed to get the job that you thought was really cool. Right, I mean that, that's that's part of this too. Is like it's like a, it sounds dumb, but like a faith in yourself and then like the stick to itiveness to actually put it out your own particular vision, I think counts for a lot in helping your career, right? Oh, absolutely, and I hear that all the time too. That it's just like don't don't bother like sending in you know un, unsolicited like pitches and stuff like that to these companies. You need to work on your own thing, and then you know if it gets good on its own, then people will contact you about other stuff. And I hear that all the time. And then, yeah, that's totally what happened with me. I was at the American Library Association conference last year, and there was a panel of uh, trade book publishers, Scholastic, HarperCollins, those kinds of folks who are all doing graphic novels now. Uh, and the question was asked of them, uh, how do you find authors to work with? I mean, do you, do you accept queries from agents, or do you, know, or do you, do you need an agent inquiry? And they're like, no, no, we just look at webcomics. If something <laughs> looks good, and if, if it looks like it's, it's got you know, a following, an audience, and it seems like it's well-written, then we're going to contact them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, you know, how the model has changed from the days of sending in sol submissions to an editor over and over again, when really yeah. the, the way to submit now is just to put your stuff out there for people to find, right? Yeah, I, I think I think, uh, I think people know that, like, the, uh, the if, if someone's, you know, the, the, the people who are good now don't have the patience to wait for approval from a, from a corporation. They're just going to go out and make it. And those are the ones who are passionate enough about to do it. And they're the ones that sort of come out on top. And that's, you know, that's where the talent is these days. But this also was like, you know, the early days of Dr. McKinja was you cutting your teeth as like a real full-fledged writer too, right? I mean, that's how you establish your credibility in the public, but also like how you get good at it is just by putting in the... Well, the, yeah, just by doing it, yeah. yeah. You, know, you, don't get, you don't get worse at something you do every day. Yeah. You know, until you get older and start losing your facilities. <laughs> that's, that'll be a show for later on in my career. <laughs> I'll get back to you in about 40 years. <laughs> I hope it's longer than that. <laughs> uh, uh, so am I missing anything, Lauren? Is there anything that, that I uh, overlooked in what we should be... I mean, we got a, a brilliant mind here that we should be fully uh, tearing apart. Oh, who's that? Yeah, let them talk. Sitting <laughs> <laughs> on this guy. Whoa. Here's another sign of success. You've got a TV Tropes page. That's pretty cool. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I I mean I think I think that 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 massive list on TV tropes is because uh, part of Doctor Ninja is very much uh, the great deal of joy that I take in subverting uh, tropes and cliches, and so they catch all of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have one more. I have one more that I'm curious about, and this is something that I think is really pertinent to young people who are starting out in this business. Um, and this is a dicey one, so I mean, feel free to to plead the fifth or back out of the question if you want to. Uh, dealing with trolls, you put yourself oh, yeah. online. No matter how good your intentions are, no matter how you present yourself, there's going to be the crowd of people who gather around to say, "Fail! You did it wrong! You're no good!" Uh, you know, I get emails all the time. Uh, well, not all the time, but every once in a while, I get an email from somebody who's really trying to wreck my day. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the first thing I see when I look at the, when I open up my email in the morning, you know, is like, "Oh, you know, why do you even get out of bed? You you have no business doing what you're doing." Uh, and you know, this is a tough one that every young person's got to encounter, and they got to deal with it in their own way. But I'm just wondering, you know, for somebody who's a fan of your work, how if you have any thoughts on how do you deal with that kind of business? Um, well, um, for uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I was actually discussing this with Carly the other day because uh, there was a period there where I was actually kind of insulated from it for a while. I wasn't really getting any hate for a while. I kind of uh, let my guard down a little bit. And then um, when the Deadpool fear itself came out, uh, very mixed reviews to that because I was dealing, it wasn't just fans of Dr. McNinja anymore. People who, you know, and it's like people who don't like Dr. McNinja, they just, they'll just go to another website and they'll never read it again. Deadpool fans paid for this, found that they didn't like my writing, and then were very, very upset about that $3 or whatever that they lost. Um, and so I had to kind of remind myself to just not care. And um, for one thing, don't seek out reviews. <laughs> just if you know, just wait for a nice person to email you. Don't yeah. don't look at forums um, because there's a whole other issue of things with the forums. You know, generally just you know, I just kind of have to realize that anybody who's writing on a, a Deadpool forum, you know, complaining about something, like don't forget they secretly wish that they were writing it themselves. And there's there's always going to be a little bit of that. And there's all sorts of little things you tell yourself to make yourself feel better about it. Um, but yeah, I just, I just, um, I don't know, I'm generally sort of easygoing about a lot of things and just had to kind of remind myself, like, yeah, I don't care about it. But, um, a big part of it is that if someone sends me a nasty message on Twitter, or one that's just, just a little too snarky, I'll just block them. You know, I'm just like, yep, I never have to hear from you ever again. <laughs> or I'll, I'll filter emails if someone if sends me even slightly mean email, I'll just filter it. I, you know, I've, 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 you know, I've, I, I, I'm very open with you know answering emails and stuff like that, and um, you know I've written back to a lot of fan mail, and I, it's, I used to sort of like try to reason with people, but it gets to a volume after doing it for a certain number of years. I'm like, I don't care. Like, I do not need to waste my energy dealing with this person. If they're offended, I'm not writing back, or they think that I'm a wimp for not being able to deal with their criticism. I really just don't care. So you know, is it is it an allocation of resources thing then? I mean, is that what it's what you're talking about here? Yeah, totally. I just I just do not have the energy to deal with it, so I just filter it away and never. And I I find myself forgetting about it very quickly because I have so many other things to think about, and that's that's very pleasant. Yeah, yeah, because this you know it's like it's the it's it's an easy trick for a creative person to fall into when you hear somebody say something bad about you to say, oh my gosh, what if they're right, right? And you have oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, but you you never take it public with them then I'm t I take it. I try not to. I I'm I may have occasionally <laughs> like maybe made a snarky response on Twitter or something like that. But I always have to remind myself not to do that. And uh, generally, yeah, it's just I find myself feeling a lot more sane and less stressed out just ignoring it and blocking it and making it go away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and like you said, if if you're doing it right, you're too busy to even deal with that kind of stuff. But. <laughs> You know, but there, there is, I mean, the, I, another thing to acknowledge to young people who may be listening is that there is a, we're sharing our stuff because we want people to like it because we want to make people happy, you know, right? I mean, that, that we have to admit that that's there. There's that desire to perform. And so when somebody says, I don't like the way you're performing, uh, there's an equal desire to go, why? You know, I'll, let me, what do I got to do to make you happy here, pal? You know, but that, that that's uh, death, isn't it? That's yeah, I have absolutely sent that email out at like earlier stages. In, in things, you know, and they'd be like, try to like, well, tell me what, what's going on. Like, then, you know, like, I'm like, listen, if, if they could send you a halfway decent critique, they would have done it to start with. Yep. And, uh, yeah. so. 
And so, I mean, who do you take critiques from in your life? Um, I, you know, anybody that I, that I, you know, I, I have plenty of creative friends that I, that I trust and like, and, uh, I'll talk to them about different things. Um, you know, my, my lovely wife, uh, <laughs> just looked at me right now. <laughs> uh, you know, she, she, I, I talked to Carly a lot about, about stuff, uh, because she's, she's very uh, smart in her creative ways. And, um, honestly, you know, if, if I do get a, a fan letter that's, that's, that is very like well thought out and actually like gets to something and I'm like oh you know that's actually that's a good point and you know maybe I will have a conversation but generally uh, the, the the critical fan mails come in from this weird sort of point of they make an assumption that's wrong and then they just go on this really long tear about that and I just have to be like you're no it's actually this if you would have read that page I would have explained away this entire thing and uh, yeah. That that even yeah that even happens with the enthusiasts too, doesn't it? Like they would say, send you sometimes an email that is uh, under the, the the subtext is that they want to be the one who figured it out. They want to they want your approval of being the expert on your oh, yeah. on your story, right? Yeah, you do get that. But yeah, this is something I tell young people too. Is like uh, if if you're gonna go approach somebody who you admire or respect, try to identify three things that you think they do better than anybody else, and just talk to them about those things because they're gonna be so delighted that you picked up on what was one of the things that they worked really hard on, and sure. they're gonna want to have a dialogue with you then, right? Yeah, I mean, no, I, I like that a lot better than than um, than like this idea that like, oh my God, I've spotted an error in the comic. Yeah, I must craft the most perfectly hilarious email letting them know about why they screwed up so bad and then they're gonna see how smart I am about it and they're gonna sit and then I'm gonna have helped the comic and they're gonna be really impressed with how funny I was and we're gonna be best friends forever when really I'm just like you could have just told me that I spelled their wrong in this instance right. and I could have said thank you and I would have fixed it and it, instead of being like oh is your spell checker out today <laughs> that, that's, that gets a block like I Right, right. Yeah. So, so it's 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 not hard, people. It's just identify three things that, that your favorite person does that nobody else can do, or doesn't do as well, or they have a special yeah, spin on it. Don't kiss ass, though. No, no. But I mean, but 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 if you're gonna if you're gonna approach somebody, it's like you know, kissing butt is a different thing altogether. That's like come up saying like, oh my god, it's the most amazing comic ever, and I just can't live without it. And thank you so much for making this happen. Right. Not that I mind that either. <laughs> <laughs> well, we. I don't know, it can get unnerving though sometimes, don't you think? When somebody's like that, yeah. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Thank you. I, I, that, that, it is a good comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, but but I, I don't know. It's just like the, the best conversations I've ever had with a creative person is usually when I start off with that, but with like something specific that I noticed in their work that I got absolutely. something out of. Yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm a, absolutely the same. Like I I have definitely occasions where I'm waiting in line to get something signed at a convention, and I'm like, oh god, what do I talk about? Yeah. And usually it comes to like that. That's a, that's a very nice way to sort of sum that up. And um and my favorite conversations that I have with people who come up to me usually pick up on something that isn't something I talk about a lot, but obviously it's something I thought about and put into the comic. Yeah. And, uh, well, cool. Well, man, I think we covered a lot of stuff today. People are saying in the chat that this might be the best episode of Comics Are Great ever, so thank you, Chris. Yes. You did it. <laughs> and I had David Malky on here before, and they're still saying that. Oh, oh, oh yeah. no. no. Yeah. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> That's right. They're throwing it down. Very, very smart and sharp, quick man in these situations. Uh, yeah. Like, defeat him ever. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, being in the same room with him, I felt like I was treading water the entire time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been on, on, his, on his old podcast, Tweet Me Harder, which is essentially this, like, really, really fast form improv, like, chit-chat thing. And, it, yeah. yeah, treading water. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you uh, coming on here uh, and and sharing all this really smart stuff with us, Chris. I mean, this this was really great. This is one this is one of the better ones that we've done. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, so we should say that uh, the Adventures of Doctor McNinja is at drmcninja.com. You're going to be at SPX this September 11th uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, that's at spexpo.com. Uh, any other appearances that you want to make any noise about? Yeah, I'm pulling that up right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. I have um, 
I, I will be going to uh, the inaugural Web Comics Con in Norwalk, Connecticut on October 1st. Uh, so, got a lot of great Web Comics creators in that one. It's sort of a smaller show, and uh, I think it'll be like a really, uh, really neat time. And then uh, November 5th, I'll be also at the debuting Kamikaze in LA. Very exciting, I think, for LA to get uh, a decent big convention. I think. It's sort of like New York felt the same way for a while there too before New York Comic Con. I was like, "Where's our, where's our, our big con? We're, a, you know, we're a big coastal city here." Yeah. I think, hey, this this might be it for LA, which I think would be great. Oh, cool. All right, we'll put links to all those in the show notes. Um, any other final thoughts? I I, I I closed out an episode a couple episodes back where I closed it out really fast, and I got an email from the guest saying, "Hey, you didn't give me a chance for final thoughts," and I felt terrible about that. I, it, it haunts me, so I want to give you guys a chance for that. Uh, no final thoughts, but I think we, we did discuss earlier that you said you were going to, you said there might have been questions from the, yeah. the live chat. Mostly it's just, thing. It's, 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 the chat is filled with people. I think my people. mom listens for watching. <laughs> she uh, might not log in questions. But she can reach me whenever she wants. She does. Oh, somebody is asking a question. Mostly it's people saying that you're handsome, believe it or not. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, I do believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, here come the questions. Uh, I'm curious, what classes helped you the most in school? Um, well, you know, the the ones that I that I uh, that I talked about, I'll, I will name. I mean, it was basically in the the SVA cartooning program. You have sort of your main cartooning class each year, and in your sophomore year, they call it principles cartooning. Junior year is pictorial problems, and senior year is portfolio. And basically, you you sort of have one on a lot of one on one and. Uh, critique time with a specific creator and they, they teach you these basics and the sophomore year we weren't allowed to put any words in our comics uh, which was really great to do that for a year like you can only tell like you make your comics but no dialogue no narration harder that than it seems out, that helped out the uh, the story challenge tremendously but then junior year we're allowed to have words we're like all right now we teach you how to use the words and how to sort of mingle them together uh, and then you know senior year was just Walt telling us how much we we sucked, and we need to look for reference <laughs> to that portfolio look at work. Actually, you know that, that is that is one thing. Going back to this idea of identifying three things that you do well, uh, one of the things that I love about your comic is your balloon placement is great, and oh. that is something that I see a lot of web cartoonists screw up: is balloon placement and figuring out where to put them so that it's aesthetically pleasing in the panel and it's logical, so you can tell where you're supposed to read next. That's something that's that a lot of people really even even seasoned people who just aren't used to lettering you know they just they they mess that one up oh that's so funny because like that is totally like the last thing i do on the comic and takes the least amount of time and <laughs> but yeah I, I i definitely i mean that's that's something that i learned in school was like you need to make sure things read from left to right yeah. make sure that your balloons don't cross because it gets confusing have a little bit of room in the balloons maybe sketch it out so you know where your balloons are going to go I get really mad at myself if I have to cover up part of someone's head with a balloon or sometimes I get upset. I'm like, ah, the balloon's like covering their body and it looks like they're eating the words and like, ah, I should have planned better. Well, it reads well, you know, I mean, <laughs> and, and actually, and that's another thing that I appreciate about your work too, is that you actually, you know, put more than a couple of balloons in a panel. I mean, but it's a joke. It's, it's, it's a humor series. So of course the dialogue figures into it largely. Well, I got to get that plot moving too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you need to keep it going. One more question. Uh, what helped you most in drawing those action scenes? Because your action scenes did get a lot better really fast in that series. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just having the time to uh, plot them out. Um, yeah, I just uh, I understand that an action scene needs to look good, and I just put a lot of thought and planning into it. And I'm, when I have the time, I'm, I very much uh, enjoy uh, composition and design within a comics page. I often, just having to crank out these pages, don't really have time to think about anything beyond the basics of just sort of focal point and composition kind of things. But when I have a nice action sequence, I know I really need to put the time in. And that, that's really just it. I try to put the time in. Yeah, that's a grinding thing. That's like doing like establishing shots. That's something you've been struggling with, Lauren, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, Three-point perspective. And then if you want to draw some, you know, a guy punching a dinosaur, it's got to look cool. And yes. that means you got to put in the time to make it look cool, right? Get the anatomy, right? Get the yeah, pose. Yeah, and right. I will say, well, one thing I did to make myself have a page where there's a decent dinosaur punching, I was like, it's a splash page. I'm not going to worry about other panels. I'm just going to spend all day drawing this one illustration. It'll look nice and it'll be satisfying. No one will be mad that there's not two more panels where guys are making jokes about what's going on. Right. Uh, 
Being, you mentioned the, the three-point perspective. This this is something I found very useful is uh, the uh, computer program Manga Studio. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've talked about those on the program at all. No, or... not not much. Um, it totally does the perspective for you. What? You can, yeah, you. It's uh, there's a lot more perspective in my comics. You might have noticed, like a lot more <laughs> shelves. Uh, <laughs> what an admission! This is this is like a uh, scoop. <laughs> you you set the vanishing points in the program. And then it just forces when you draw, it makes the lines go in the right, towards the right vanishing points. And like you can just like sketch out like a, a interior or exterior, like buildings, three point, two point, one point perspective. So much faster to do it this way. You don't have to get the ruler and be like, you know, oh like that. Oh my gosh! Yeah. And it makes it a lot faster and easier, and uh, takes takes the um, the uh, the annoyingness out of perspective drawing, and uh, frees up a little bit of time and energy to actually consider doing something neat with it. So that 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 even is sounds better than using Google SketchUp, you know? I do. Yeah, uh, I every single vehicle in Doctor Manja is traced, um, and it used to be off of photographs before. Oh, and like um, the reason why Doctor Ninja drives a Honda Accord um, that uh, the model changes so often is because well, he originally was gonna you know he always I always thought it'd be fine if he drove a Honda Accord because uh, that's my mom's car. <laughs> and, uh, I just thought that'd be funny. Uh, but Honda's website, I don't know if it still does, but they used to have a 3D model of the car that you could turn around to any angle you wanted. And I would do that, and I would just take screen grabs. And, and But the problem is that they don't have the most recent model. So his car, he just, he just keeps getting a new Honda. Every <laughs> That's the model that was that. But now with SketchUp, I can, I can pick an older model. <laughs> Wow. So is Manga Studio Pro is that what you said it was? Yeah, you got to use I think for that for the they have they have well it's Manga Studio EX4 is the one I use. I'm sure they update it all the time because that's at least software people work. But uh yeah, they one of the versions um it'll it'll put in uh they'll it'll do a perspective grid, which is very handy and I used to do that, but the one where it just let just forces you drawing things towards the perspective points automatically uh, totally worth the, the purchase. Yeah, th th I, I think, think it's been on sale for like a hundred dollars. Th this, uh, I think, what you just said was like a re uh, revelation of Laura, and she's, I, yeah, I haven't seen you make a face like that in a long time. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was for me too. I, I blew my mind, it, and like I said, a lot more bookshelves. <laughs> 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 oh, that's awesome. I think that that's like the best tip of today. So, wow. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, for both for your time and all the, the, the really awesome insights. And, you know, and thanks for making Dr. McNinja. So. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I, I enjoyed myself very much. Oh, cool. All right. Well, um, we'll have to do this again sometime. Uh, I'll, I'm going to be at SPX, too, so I'll see you there. I'll stop by. Oh, I'll see you there. Great. Yeah, cool. So, I, I'll, too bad I can't bring Lauren. You're going to be in school. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. But anyway, but yeah, anyway, okay. So, I'm going to wrap this up. So, uh, Christopher Hastings, Dr. McNin Dr. McNinja dot com, uh, Dr. Hastings on Twitter, right? <laughs> yes. And then uh, you're on the Google Plus too, and any other other places where people can find you? Yep, I've been I've been Dr. Hastings for a long time, and usually that's how you can find me on these various things. I actually run into a lot of trouble with uh, other Dr. Hastings on uh, Gmail who think that their email address is mine. You know what? And they're all chiropractors. <laughs> <laughs> when I was looking you up on Skype before we recorded today, I, I saw Dr. C. Hastings. Like, well, that's got to be him. And then, so I, okay. I sent the invite, the Skype invite, and then, like, the producer, Matt, said to me, he's like, what if it's, like, some, like, uh, oral surgeon, you know? And, like, you just invited <laughs> him to, to, to be friends at, uh, on our, our Skype account here. And I got to try calling him, and he's too busy, you know, cutting into somebody's mouth. Uh, <laughs> but, but, yeah, I, it, that didn't occur to me until this morning that when I was trying to look you up. But, uh, okay, so Dr. Hastings on the Twitter, drmaninja.com. Thank you very much for being here, Chris. And Lauren Hauser is at blizzardpaw.deviantart.com. Blizzardpaw on Twitter. Blizzardpaw everywhere, right? Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah, any other places where people can find you? The Tumblr. Yeah, I have Tumblr. Blizzardpaw.tumblr.com if you want to see animated GIFs. <laughs> well, I actually have a Tumblr for the Innocent. There's not much on there yet. But, oh, really? What is it? Uh, severeddestiny.com. Severed Destiny with the period in between it at Tumblr. <laughs> Severed Destiny dot Tumblr. No, maybe there's not a period there. I don't know. <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> but you're on Tumblr and you post funny things and you retweet a lot of FES student, uh, art student owl. Yes. Yeah. A lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, commiseration with being an art student. So thank you, Lauren. Good to see you. Have fun at school. Okay, everybody, um, let's get out of here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for downloading, watching, and listening. Uh, this show's done every week uh, at comicsgreat.tv. 
uh, and you can get the podcast later on at comicsgreat.com. The, the, actually, the address will be comicsgreat.com slash CAG2424. So uh, until next time, everybody, I've been Jersey Drozd, uh, jdrozd.com, Jersey on the Twitters. Uh, thanks again, and okay, bye. <laughs>